Good morning. Are we ready to worship this morning? Amen. A great and wondrous mighty God we serve. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Stand with me, please. morning, we do so in a world that many of us would like to escape. We do that in a world where all kinds of stuff is going all kinds of wrong. Stop the world and let me get off. But that's not why he put us here. He put us here so that we would stand in and amongst all that is going on in our world and be salt and light to pray, to encourage, to witness, to love, to do what He's called us to do. This morning as we open, I am aware that New Day Fellowship, our brothers and sisters just down the road, have had an exposure to COVID that has gone through their church. They've got three families infected right at the moment. And, you know, just like us, they're greeting one another with hugs and handshakes and stuff happens. And somebody came to church that didn't know they were sick. And I ask that we would open our prayer this morning, mindful not just of this congregation, but mindful of every congregation that gathers under the name of Christ around the world. We stand together as the ambassadors for Christ. And it doesn't matter what labels over the door. If they love Jesus, they're brothers and sisters to us. So let's start this morning not focused on our own belly buttons. Let's start this morning not focused on our issues and our concerns. But let's open this morning with a word of prayer for the church at large in Carroll County and beyond. You bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, as we come together this morning on this second day of Advent, as we come to celebrate your peace, we also come, Lord God, to celebrate the peace that we find in relationship with you and the peace that we find in fellowship with fellow believers. I ask, Lord God, this morning for the pastors and the congregations of the churches, Eureka Springs, Holiday Island, Barreville, all the communities around us, Lord, that this morning we might be encouraged as a people to continue to stand in a world that seems to be getting darker by the moment, that we would be your light and shine your light into dark places, that 
those whom you have called to your side would hear your voice, receive your offer for salvation, and come to know you. Lord, we pray that we might be vessels to carry your Holy Spirit into the lives of others. And this morning, we're specifically mindful of New Day, Paul and Danielle and the congregation that they serve. Lord, you know this disease that has run rampant through our earth and is continuing to cause mischief and separate and divide people and has become one of the most politicized things in recent history. But Lord, the reality is people get sick and if they get sick enough, they die. And while that is the way of this fallen sinful world, we know that by your hand we can count on healing, first in the spiritual and then in the physical. And so we lift up this morning the New Day Fellowship, our brothers and sisters who worship there, that you would continue to heal those that are sick, that you would continue to protect those who this would be devastating to. And that, Lord God, you would stop the spread this moment. That your name might be glorified. That your hand would be seen amongst us. That we would know that you have acted. Lord God, I pray that each member of the clergy that step up into this exalted desk this morning would speak your truth. Whatever building whatever outside arena, whatever place they stand in, Lord. May their words be cut short if their agenda is of their own. But may their voices be loud and strong when they speak Your Word, when they speak Your truth, when they speak from Your Spirit the message that You have prepared for that audience at that place at this time. Lord God, we would pray that you would be with us as we seek to honor you, to worship you, to give you all adoration and praise and thanksgiving. For Lord, we do celebrate your coming, but we also celebrate your soon return, your promised second coming, when you will make all things in this world right, when you will wipe the tears from our eyes, that you will ban all sickness and disease and death and sin will be no more. Lord, we long for that day, and we pray that you would give us strength to endure, boldness to speak, and the infilling of your Holy Spirit to empower us to do what you've called us as followers of you to do, that we might reach into the world, spread the gospel, loving you as we love our neighbors, and that we might be an evidence of your glory in this world this day. And for that, we will give you praise and glory and adoration through Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. This morning we're going to light the second Advent candle. Let us hear God's word. Psalm 85, verse 8 through 13. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints. But let, the, let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Amen. Last Sunday we lit the first candle of our Advent wreath, the candle of hope. We light it again as we remember that Christ who was born in Bethlehem will come again to fulfill all God's promises to us. The second candle of Advent is the candle of peace. Peace is a word that we hear a lot, but our world is far from peaceful. 
It is one of the things that we hope for. Christ brought us peace when he first came into when he first came to us, and he will bring everlasting peace when he comes again. The prophet Isaiah called Christ, quote, the Prince of Peace, unquote. When Jesus came, he taught people the importance of being peacemakers. He said to those that who make peace shall be called the children of God. The peace of God comes from being in right relationship with him. Christmas is all about God making us right with himself through Jesus. We light the candle of peace to remind us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace and that through him, true peace is found. Peace is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this candle, we celebrate the peace we find in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. God of grace, sometimes our lives and actions are anything but peaceful. Help us to quiet our minds, our mouths, and bodies, to be still and invite in the peace that only comes through you. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word, and to do the will by sharing your peace and uh, with each other. Guide us in all ways that we say and do, and that we may reflect your love and peace now and forever. Amen. Please stand with me as we continue to worship and to praise with song. next song how great thou art seems to be a favorite here as in a lot of places full of a lot of praise and power I was thinking when I was sitting over there and, and listening to the Advent reading and that and just on the way up here for that matter from Sunday school in our lesson this morning my tendency when I think of praise is power 
you know, sometimes quietly, but always that power. But the video we were watching this morning, <laughs> it said when he was a young man, he heard a sermon on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And when he left the church, he said he was kind of inward type of young man. When he got to his street where his house was at, he looked around to make sure no one was watching. And he said, I danced home. I had heard that God Almighty through his Holy Spirit was living in me. And I danced home. There's a lot of different ways to praise. A lot of different ways to worship. If you need to dance, get up and dance. I don't care. But on this song, something I would ask of you. We're gonna, when we were singing this morning in practice, we did it just a little bit differently than what we normally do. So join with us, sing with us, follow along, or if you want, just listen and praise in your hearts. How great thou art. Yeah. 
The wonderful Christian writer C.S. Lewis once said, Life with God is not immunity from difficulties, but peace in difficulties. And Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled, nor fearful. This peace promise was given during Jesus' last time with his disciples before his arrest and crucifixion. Jesus' peace given to us? The peace of Jesus? What, what does that even look like? Well, it looks like Jesus on the cross. Despite his torture, despite his terrible pain, think of what he said and did. First, he asked the Father to forgive those who were crucifying him. He asked John to take Mary into his own home as his mother. He saved a thief that was being crucified with him just for the asking. He quoted from Psalm 22. And he had the peace of mind to decide when it was finished. Jesus promised to give us that kind of godly peace if we'll turn away from the world and form a personal connection with Him. And we think, I, that's Jesus. I can never have that kind of peace. Read about some of the saints. Some people just like us who were boiled to death, crucified upside down, burned to death, and yet during that time praised God as the fire shot out from the ends of their fingers. You can have that peace. It's your connection with Jesus Christ that determines that. Not how much you know, not how much you do. It's your connection with the crucified Christ. So as we partake of these elements, think of Jesus on the cross. The example He set for us the peace promise He gave to us and the eternal personal connection He desires to have with us. Let us pray. Father, thank You. Thank You for peace. Thank You for that peace that changes us internally that changes our spirit, that changes our mind, that changes our emotion. And Father, we know that that came from Jesus Christ. The peace that He gives us. The peace that no one understands. But the peace that people know who have the connection with Him. Help us to remember that as we partake of these elements the juice and the bread, the peace of love. In His name, amen. How about we read a little bit from Second Peter this morning? Second Peter, the first chapter, verses 3 and 4. Our personal connection with Jesus involves sharing. Now listen to what Peter says. His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. 
Through these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world. God shares the divine nature so that we may become partakers of the divine nature. Jesus sees to it that those who are His become partakers of the divine nature. If God will share with us by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, should we not be willing to share generously from our lives and our resources? Pray with me. Father, open our hearts. Open us to see that divine sharing. And Lord, we pray that it may move us to share not just this morning, but to share every day of our lives with you, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and with those who need your connection so desperately. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our brother and our friend, we pray. Amen. Exodus chapter 14. As you turn to that book, you think, Exodus, that's not a Christmas book. You're right. You're wrong. Every book is a Christmas book. The themes of hope and peace, joy and love are in every verse of the Bible. Even when he's destroying everybody? Yes. Because his love is demonstrated. That he knows how to set things right. He is a just and faithful God. I hope you enjoyed the Hillel. The what? Well, you'll remember last week I asked you guys to read through Psalm 113 to 118 as part of the readings of the Hanukkah week. And that's called the Halal. So I hope that you enjoyed reading through those. You read that, again, from the book of Psalms. Psalmas, which is a Greek word that means to touch or to pluck, as it refers to an instrument. You see... Psalms are not simply poems. They're actually lyrics to songs. When you look at the book of songs, you're reading a song book. In the Hebrew, the word is mitzmor, and it means a song or a melody with words. I want you to stop and think with your knowledge of our culture, and I want you to pick the top 150 songs ever. That's what Psalms is to the Jewish nation. Their best 150 songs in one compendium to be carried on through the generations. Now, not all the songs of praise are found in the book of Psalms. In fact, they are all through both the Old Testament and the New Testament. They're all through the Bible. But the first two that we find in scriptures as we're reading from the front show up in our passage today. But as the children of God start this story in chapter 14 of Exodus, they're not praising God. As we go back, I just remind you from Exodus chapter 12, verses 37 through 38, the Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, and there were about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. And many other people went with them, 
as well as large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. Jumping forward to Exodus 13, verses 20 through 22, after leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud nor by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Two to two and a half million people, their possessions, their herds, all moving at the breakneck speed of the slowest animal because you wouldn't leave anyone behind led by a continuous presence of God in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. The very presence of God right there in front of them. Follow me, children. They have seen the power of God humble Egypt. And now they march under His divine protection. And that's where we pick up in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pihahirath, between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think, The Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I want to speak to that idea for just a moment, because that makes God sound like some kind of puppeteer. The word that's used here is a Hebrew word, hazak that means literally to be or become strong, to strengthen, to prevail, to harden, to be courageous, to be sore or severe. And I want you to put that back here. God gave Pharaoh a heart of strength and courage to do what he chose to do. You see, God enabled Pharaoh to have the courage to do what he was thinking he wanted to do anyway. It isn't that God put the idea in Pharaoh's heart. It was already there. He'd lost his kingdom. He'd lost his son. He'd lost all of his slaves. No way they live. No way they live. And so he begins to do this pursuit. You see, knowing his character, God knows what this will lead to. And he simply gives Pharaoh his own head. Go ahead, son. Do what you think is best. See, God doesn't darken Pharaoh's counsel, but gives him the courage and the strength of heart to do what is already inside him to do, which is evil. And God finishes this portion out saying that He will gain glory. You ever wonder from whom? <laughs> I mean, who in the world is God going to gain glory from? Well, as we will see in these coming passages, from the Egyptians, from the Israelites, and from the Canaanite nations. He is going to demonstrate His glory to everyone in the story. We pick up again in verse 5. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, we, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they encamped by the sea 
near Pahirath, opposite Baal Zephon. The chariot was the most advanced military weapons system of the ancient Near East. I want you to stop about today's weapons and go back these 4,000 years to this time period where wars were fought with short swords, spears, bows and arrow, hand-to-hand combat. The, the, the best you could do was an arrow. The best you could do is a spear you could throw. And then suddenly you have this wheeled vehicle, the chariot, hardened on its exterior to act like a tank, barreling down upon them like a high-speed weapons platform. You see, the chariot wasn't some little dinky thing. It was wide enough for three men to stand abreast in. One was guiding the horses, and the other two were either fighting with spears, swords, or bows and arrow. Bladed wheels, swords in hand, bows and arrows to defend. I want you to imagine stepping out of here this morning, going out onto the highway, and jousting with a truck. With armed warriors in the bed, coming at you at 25 miles an hour. Because that was the speed of the best chariot of the Egyptian world. This is a terrifying weapon system, especially when you're the children of Israel, slaves, who have run out with all of your possessions, and one of your possessions isn't a big knife. So here you stand, nowhere to run, no fortress, no protection, no weapons, and you're backed up to the sea. There's nowhere to go. They're sitting ducks. And so as we continue in verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. And now we've read the end of the story. And we know how this all turns out. And we look back and we think, ah, where is your faith? Faith in what? This is a God of their forefathers who they've been told stories about. They're still looking at Moses as the perpetrator of the Exodus. They weren't in the throne room. They don't know what was going on between Pharaoh and Moses. All they know is one day they were slaves, and the next day they were being run out, and there were all of these ugly things happening in between those two. Oh, Moses keeps mentioning this God, but he's mentioning it to the leadership, and the leadership is telling the next level of leadership, and that level of leadership is telling... You ever played the game Telephone? What, what was the guy on the street actually hearing about what was going on, and how much had it been changed or elaborated on? No, there's still no recognition of God. There's still no place of faith for them. They haven't seen His glory. And while this would seem like romanticizing their experience, I want you to hear their complaint. It is better to live as a slave than to be slaughtered in a battle with the world's leading superpower. Unarmed. Any of you disagree? That's the reality of their complaint. Dude, if all you did was bring us out here so we could be slaughtered, nobody wants to be cannon fodder or pra target practice. Dude, we were better as slaves than as human targets. We continue in verse 13. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. 
fuck up, dude. Come on, Brett, give me this stiff upper lip. He just encourages them. But I want you to notice who he says is going to save them. Him? Nope. Them? Nope. God. I understand that you see this army and you're scared to death, and I would be too. But stand up. God's got something going on here, and he's got a plan. He didn't bring us out here to slaughter us. I don't know what the plan is yet, but we'll find out together. He points the people back to God. Largely because this isn't his idea. I would remind you, this is the guy who gave God all the excuses why he wasn't the guy to lead them out of, Israel, or out of Egypt. <laughs> I mean, you remember the whole burning bush thing? <laughs> you know, I want you to go. Are you sure? <sighs> go. But I can't talk right. Will you go? But they might not listen to me. Will you go? Time and time again, Moses is like, I don't want to lead them. God said, I'm not asking. So now, when everything is going wrong and everybody's looking at him going, why did you do this? He's like, see? Not me if, him if. But I don't know what he's got in mind, but we're going to find out together. You know why I know this? Because of verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. <laughs> I love this. You're showing this front to the people. <laughs> the Lord will save you this day. And what's the first thing God says? Stop talking to me. Because <laughs> you know Moses is back there going, Really? This is the plan? You're bringing them out? They're looking at me. What? How are we? Who is it? <laughs> God's like, Stop talking. Listen, raise your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all of his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. You see, God provides a way out. That is the promise of this entire book. God always says, I'm going to provide a way out. You can't see it. You can't anticipate it. You couldn't make this stuff up. But I've got a way out for you. And what he is going to do, he claims, will bring glory in the eyes of the Egyptians. <laughs> wait, 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 what? Did you all see what I saw there in 19? Angel of God is marching in front of them, and then it's not till later in 19 that we get the pillar of cloud and the pillar of... Whoa! I don't have just the pillar. I've got the angel of God. That Why didn't anybody mention him? He's been here the whole time. And now he goes, hey, I got this. Y'all done? Get right up against the beach. Good, good. You a little closer? Yeah, you're a little out of frame. Certain, yeah, okay, good. Right there. Now, these would be my people. How about y'all just stay over there? And when he moves, so do the two pillars, or the pillar of cloud. And so it goes over there, and all night long, this angel of the Lord who has been marching alongside the pillar turns and holds off the Egyptian army, and he uses the pillar to blind the Egyptians in absolute pitch black darkness. They can't see tough to ch chase somebody you can't see. That's why the army invented night vision goggles. 
You want to be able to see something. But they can't see. Meanwhile, on the other side, Israel looks like a road construction lamp. <laughs> they can see the fish in the water. The ones in the deep water. I mean, it's bright light. It is daytime on one side and absolute pitch black on the other. So that they can make a night march across the bed of an ocean, a sea, Remember, this is two and a half million souls, all of their herds, all of their possessions. They didn't go fast, and they didn't go single file. This was a wide opening to get those people through in a single night. We pick up in verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. And the waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. My favorite picture of this is from Prince of Egypt. You ever go watch that cartoon? Man, it is such a fantastic telling of this story. But I love, they're walking through and looking over and there's this mountain of water and looking out at them is a whale. What are you doing? You know, <laughs> it was that a beautiful picture, this wall of water on either side. Now, I've heard some scientists trying to make sense of this history suggest that the water wasn't very deep if the wind could blow it back. Okay. It was deep enough to drown the Egyptians. So which one is the miracle? Either the water wasn't very deep and God drowned the Egyptian army, their chariots, their horses in an inch and a half of water. That would be a miracle. Or the water was as deep as we think it is and the miracle is as awesome as we think it is. Now, I want you to recognize that the Red Sea comes up and it does this around the Sinai Peninsula. So the two little juts that come up off of the sea is what we're talking about them crossing. Okay, and They run mostly north to south. And the Bible tells us that it was an east wind. And so if you've got a north and south water with an east wind, you're blowing a trough through this area. Which means not only are these people moving as fast as the slowest animal, they're also walking into a headwind. There's yet another miracle. How is it that the wind is blowing hard enough to blow a trough in the water and yet people can walk against it? incredible story that we have here. Miracle after miracle. A pillar making night and making day. Wind cutting a trough. People able to go against the trough. And, oh by the way, on dry ground. No mud. There is no scientific explanation. The scientists try to understand God and His creation. That's what scientists do, and we love them for it. Trying to understand our world. <laughs> God knows who He is and how He does what He does, and we may never figure it out. We pick up in verse 23. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. And during the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. <laughs> Sorry, I was just reading that for the 15th time this week. And I could just see this guy going across there and all of a sudden this wheel jams. <laughs> you can't go anywhere. Horses are getting dizzy. You know? it's, by the way, have you ever stopped and thought about the fact that at this point the Egyptian army isn't exactly in full brute mode? Because they're going through the same miracle. They're chasing into this same trough. They're not just going, ah, they're going, whoa, this is wild. This is incredible. He jammed the wheels of their chariot so they had difficulty driving, and the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. Yahweh is fighting for them against Egypt. 
The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in Him and in Moses, His servant. You see, God sent Moses. Moses knew it. (laughs) And by this point, Pharaoh knew it too. But Israel hadn't been privy to the conversations. Now they themselves had seen and heard. I love that verse 25 and verse 31 bring out what God had said at the very beginning that the Egyptians would cry out that it was Yahweh who was fighting for them and they would give glory to God. In verse 31, the Israelites now also recognize the glory of God and they glory in Him. They also are now starting to recognize the connection between God and this leader, Moses. And they begin to follow rather than just react with the herd. Can you imagine if we had the whole Pied Piper event going through downtown Eureka Springs and everybody just started following the parade, not really understanding what was happening? That's the children of Israel leaving Egypt before the Red Sea. They're just, why are you going? Because everybody else is going. But we get across the Red Sea and now we get it. Now we see it. Now we are a people. Now we are no longer slaves. And as we get into the next chapters, we're also going to hear how the Canaanite nations hear of this event and glory in God and fear the approaching Israelites. So then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. Listen to the lyrics of this praise song. I will sing to Yahweh, for He is highly exalted. Both horse and driver He has hurled into the sea. Yahweh is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise Him. My Father's God and I will exalt Him. Yahweh is a warrior. Yahweh is His name. Pharaoh's chariots and His army He has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Yahweh, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Yahweh, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoils, I will gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. (laughs) But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, Yahweh? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? You stretch out your right hand and the earth swallows your enemies. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them. By the power of your arm, they will be as still as a stone. 
until your people pass by, Yahweh, until the people you bought pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Yahweh, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Yahweh, your hands established. Yahweh reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Shouting time. Oh. I want you to see this song. It is a song completely focused on worship, and that worship is completely focused on God. Eleven times in these passages, these first 18 verses, eleven times Yahweh is called by name. They're not confused who they're worshiping. They're not confused who their Savior is. They're not confused who has redeemed them. They know Him by name. 29 times He's referred to as you or your. 40 separate times in 18 verses. You the man. You the man. You the man. You the man. What's His name? Yahweh! What's His name? Yahweh! I say God, you say Yahweh, I say God. I mean, these guys are having a fit for themselves. Wouldn't you? You see the acts of God and His glory among the nations. They already see how this is going to affect the folks that they're going to be running into as they march to the land that they've been promised. Because all of a sudden, those promises made to Abram 400 years earlier are starting to make sense. All of a sudden, those wives' tales, that crazy stuff their dad used to tell them that they never really bought into. Oh, wait. It's happening. I get to see. This is a real deal. This is a real God bringing a real salvation to His real people. And I'm one of them. Verse 13 is the one I focused on for the title of this sermon this morning. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The word being used here is chesed. It is a word that refers to a covenant love. It is an everlasting love. It is an unfailing love. It is an unchanging, unprovoked, unchangeable love. God's never going to quit loving. And how does He describe it? That in this love, He is leading the people. He is redeeming the people. He is guiding the people. He is making them holy. This, friends, is peace. You see, it's not just a cessation of war. It's not just getting pulled out of a bad situation into a better situation. It's being where they are, still in the middle of a desert. But they're at peace. Because for the first time in their existence, they recognize the relationship they have with God. And it is the relationship of a chesed love, an eternal, unfailing, unfathomable love. This is where we find Peace. And verse 19 continues, When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam, the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord. For he is highly exalted, both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. Moses' sister finally gets a name. Say what? Well, you've got to remember that Moses and Aaron are brothers. So if this is Aaron's sister, this is Moses' sister. And this is the first time in the scriptures she's had a name. But this is the sister who followed the basket. When Mama put Moses in the Nile, this is the sister who said to Pharaoh's daughter, would you like me to find a nursemaid? This is the sister who cared about her little brother enough to step up into the courtroom of Pharaoh to offer assistance. This is a tough little girl. And now she's referred to as a prophetess. She's been speaking for God in some capacity. And the Bible doesn't even tell us what she's been doing. Her name is Miriam. 
which, by the way, will become the most popular girl's name in Israel. That's why there are so bloody many Marys in the New Testament. Because the Greek writing of the Hebrew name Miriam is Mary. That's why there's like five of them at Jesus' crucifixion. You have a hard time keeping up with all the Marys in the New Testament. Why? Because of Miriam. Everybody wanted their daughter to grow up to be a Miriam. The girls now take up a singular phrase from the song of Moses and the Israelites, and they begin to accompany them on timbrels. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. The Lord my God, my strength, my song, has now become my victory. The words are right there. The Lord my God, my strength, my song, has now become the victory. Over and over and over and over. I don't think this is two different things going on because I love this verse that we start this back off with at 19. It's like you just said that. The waters came back over and I think the author is resetting the stage. That as the men started singing this long song from verses 1 through 18, the girls were in the background singing and dancing. They caught the first verse and that's all they needed. They are off dancing. So here are the men singing and shouting and carrying on for the Lord their God, calling Yahweh by name, calling Him God, speaking to Him personally, extolling the world for His glory. And the girls are dancing around them with the timbrels going. Can you see the party? Why? For the first time, it dawns on Israel that they are truly free of Egypt. There's no more threat. They're on the other side of a sea. They're washing the soldiers wash up on the shore. There's no one to chase them. There's no reminder of where they've been or what they were doing. They have been redeemed by a God they know by name. And He knows them by name. And they learn through this act of His chesed love, His never-ending love. They find themselves not only redeemed from the situation they were in, but filled with promise and find themselves in the favor of the one true God, Yahweh. Now they're going to this promised land, a land that was promised 400 years earlier that they never thought they'd see in their life. They expected to die in Egypt a slave. And suddenly this morning, as the sun comes up, I'm on the wrong side of the sea with a floating army. And there's no one that's going to make me go back. In fact, I'm going to keep following this one who's going to take me to a promised place, who's going to give me a land with milk and honey, who is going to take care of me there just like he's taking care of me here. That's why they have a party. That's why a jubilant praise. Their dreams are intact and being fulfilled right before their eyes. And they find themselves at peace for the first time in their miserable existence, they find themselves in peace with Egypt. Who's going to complain? They find themselves at peace with the nation. They look to their right and their left, and it's just not me and my family and the clan we're a part of. It's 12 tribes, two and a half million strong, led by a God, led by a pillar, led by an angel. Here we come. Do you remember what it was to find peace with your God? Do you remember what it was like to be trapped by sin, closed in on every side, back against the river, and then suddenly, miraculously, God provided a way out? 
He redeems us. He saves us. He transforms us. And do you remember the joy as you realized you were free? For if the Son has made us free, we are free indeed. Do you remember the love that you felt as the Holy Spirit washed over your life and you understood this has said love, this everlasting, covenantal, never going to mess this up love? And do you remember the peace that flowed into your heart as you took Christ as your Lord? Are you still living in that peace? then I would ask you this morning, don't forget your first love. But sing and give praise to the One who loves you and provides a peace beyond understanding. But if you're hearing my voice today and you're still trapped in your Egypt, if you're still trapped in the sin of your life, let me just tell you, you are no longer a slave you can walk out. Follow Christ. He will provide you a way out. And He will lead you out of the sea of despair and set your feet on dry ground. He promises. He will give you a reason to be jubilant everywhere, all the time even in the midst of circumstances because He will give you forgiveness and peace. So this morning, let us praise our God and King who has ransomed us from slavery to sin and given us the promise and hope of eternal life through Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, as we look at this passage, we are reminded that the way you loved your children then is the way you love your children now. That you have called us to be a people. That you have called us to be a nation of priests. That you have called us to be your people. And Lord God, we praise You. We give You thanksgiving. We give You glory. We give You honor because You are worthy to be praised. We will extol the hand, the acts that You have done, the things that You have stretched out Your hand and done in my life, in Your life, in others' lives. Lord, every single person in here has a God story. Every single person here has seen your hand in a healing, in a providence, in sewing up at a certain time when there was no hope and there was no way out, and suddenly they found themselves on the outside looking in, wondering how in the world they got out of that one. God, you are incredible in what you allow us to survive. But Lord, that we are still here demonstrates that you are still working in our lives to bring us, transform us, redeem us into a living relationship with you. Closer, more intimate every day. Deeper, more profound, more soothing, more peaceful. No matter how crazy the world around us gets. Thank you, Lord God, that you will never leave us, never forsake us that your love is an eternal love and in that we find peace. Lord, as we close out this service this morning, we will stand and sing and I pray, Lord God, that you would receive an incense of praise that would fill your nostrils and bring you ultimate pleasure that you would sit back and laugh along with your children who laugh with you. Because you are Yahweh, God. And you sent Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Messiah, to save us so that we would be with you for eternity. We love you, Lord. Amen.
this wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace have you ever stood on the other side of that river Everybody here has. Everybody. Who provided the way out? Do you remember? Has it been that long ago that we've forgotten? Who let us who let us out? Who set us free? I've been there. I know you have too. We ought to pick up the symbols and dance. Dance our way home. That home. And giving praise and thanks every step of the way and giving praise that we still are here and have a mouth that we can tell others about so they can join us on the way. Don't forget where you've been. Give thanks for where you are now and never forget. I would invite you because every one of you either had breakfast or skipped breakfast. And by this point, your stomach thinks your throat's been cut and you're looking for something to nibble. I want you to come fellowship with us. We will be having a potluck down in the fellowship hall. And if you're like, well, we didn't bring anything. That's okay. There's plenty. Come. That we might fellowship together and celebrate um, the Lord God and His providence in Thanksgiving. And as well as celebrate for Christmas as well. So I invite you to come straight down and then at 2 o'clock, right back in here, we're going to have hymns sing. You get to pick the hymns and if you all pick all Christmas songs, that's what we'll sing. But we like to come together once a month and just sing and sing. Y'all remember what a hymn book looked like? We actually break them out, dust them off and find pages, call them out. I want to do 236! We sing, we praise. And then I invite you to join us this afternoon at 2 o'clock as we do that. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. Praise his holy name. Amen.